Late last fall, I moved to this acreage in the backwoods of Quebec. After a beautiful winter, one of the first things I want to do is explore what's been hidden beneath all of the snow and the ice at my two wildlife ponds. There's an explosion of life that begins in early spring, so for the first time I'm excited to see which amphibians, invertebrates, and fish are living in these waters. Since the ponds were buried under the snow all winter, the first thing I want to show you is what they look like now. The first pond is located at the front of the property. It's about 15 feet deep. Snow melt and rainwater collect in these two ditches, which raises the water level, and then any excess drains out through the outflow. The previous owner said he stocked this with brook trout last year, so we'll have to see if there's any still left in here. The surrounding habitat is mostly a maintained lawn that backs onto a planted pine stand. These are two habitat types that typically have low value for wildlife, so over time I'd like to shape them into a more productive area with higher plant diversity. The second pond is tucked away in the forest. It's a little smaller, but still about 15 feet deep, and it's also fed by snowmelt and rainwater. Most of it collects on the opposite side of the road, and then it fills the main pond through an underground culvert and overflows into the forest at the back. The habitat here is really nice. It's surrounded by a mixed forest with a lot of leaf litter and brush. That in addition to not having any fish in here should make this the perfect breeding site for amphibians. Now that we've seen what both ponds look like, let's go back a few weeks to when I first began exploring them. As a birder, hearing the songs of the first spring migrants is rejuvenating. But for plant life, I feel like this sound is far more exciting. Once the snow begins to melt, it forms a network of watery veins, transporting nutrients and breathing life into the thirsty forest floor. This is the cue for many amphibians to begin migrating to their breeding sites. Wood frogs were the first to arrive at the forest pond, even traveling through the last of the snow to get here. As they gathered, it took only a few days of deafening calls and mating for thousands of eggs to be laid along the shore of the pond. This is a common reproductive strategy where a large amount of offspring are produced, knowing that very few of them, if any, will survive to adulthood. It's a dangerous time not only for the egg masses, but also for the adults. Some frogs are drowned while in amplexus, others can fall from the sheer exhaustion of the breeding season, and the rest have to worry about predators. There's been raccoons, foxes, and a great horned owl on the trail cam around the pond. I've seen broadwing hawks regularly patrol the area, garter snakes, and I even found a barred owl feather floating on the water. So there's definitely no shortage of danger for these frogs, but all of this risk is worth it so long as a few of these eggs can make it to adulthood and begin reproducing. There's a long way to go. Each egg starts as a single cell, which quickly begins to divide and take shape. A little further below the surface, I noticed that these wood frog egg masses weren't alone in this pond. There were a few blue spotted salamanders laying eggs underwater, which weren't as abundant as I thought they would be, but spotted salamanders on the other hand were all over the pond and laid the most eggs out of any species. Spotted salamanders often breed in the same waters as wood frogs in early spring. They have an interesting mating behavior where males will deposit these small gelatinous capsules known as spermatophores on the substrate, which will later be picked up by females to fertilize the eggs. Some sneaky males will cover the rival males' of spermatophores with their own, just to increase their chance of reproducing. After fertilization, the female attaches the egg mass to a submerged stick or vegetation. In some parts of the pond, I started noticing these large clusters laid by many different females. Interestingly, spotted salamander masses have a clear morph and a white morph. Depending on the genetics of the female, she can produce one or the other. Both have their advantages, for example, the white morph tends to have an outer jelly layer that's more firm, making it harder for predators to get to the eggs. But the clear morph allows for better sunlight penetration, meaning the embryos could develop faster. These are just two examples of many, but overall I think having both will give us the best chance of seeing some of these embryos eventually reach adulthood. Little update at the forest pond. It's been about two weeks since the wood frogs laid their eggs, and I'm starting to see all these little wood frog tadpoles swimming around the pond. Right now, it looks like they're feeding off of the algae on this spotted salamander egg mass. But not only are there wood frog tadpoles and spotted salamanders in here, there's also all of last year's overwintered tadpoles. Overwintering as a tadpole can be a very successful strategy. By taking the extra time to grow before going through metamorphosis, they're able to get a head start on the new generation of tadpoles. 
Some of the larger ones are already growing in their hind limbs, and it won't be long now until they make their way into the forest. Over the few days that the wood frogs were hatching, I also started netting some invertebrates to see what else was living in the pond. I found a few species of diving beetle, back swimmers, dragonfly larvae, and pond snails. It took me a bit of time to find another species that blends into the vegetation really well. There we go. So this is a caddisfly larva. What you're looking at there, that's the protective case that it builds. And then, oh, okay. Buddy, what are you doing? Nope, don't eat it. I'll give you seeds after, <laughs> come on. Oh man, okay. Uh, yeah, this is the caddisfly larva protective case. And then on the inside there, that's where the caddisfly larva lives. And it's really smart because they'll use pretty much anything they can find in the pond to build these cases. In here, we mostly have vegetation. So that's why this is all little stems and pieces of grass. And there's a Cape May warbler right there. Okay, no, that's a chickadee. Buddy, one sec. There's a Cape May warbler. It just landed on the ground. There it goes. Right there. Cape May Warbler, awesome. Oh, some black throated blue. Okay, I found it again. Cape May Warbler. There's also a yellow rumped here. Migration is definitely beginning. This is awesome. Thank you for your patience. Little did I know at the time, but this pond would bring in even more warblers a couple of days later, and I'd have one of my best birding experiences so far. Late one afternoon, we had a cold front move through, along with some rain, and it grounded many of the flying insects. When I got to the pond, I noticed about 50 warblers foraging along the edge of the water, which might not sound like a lot, but of those 50, there were eight different species. Bay-breasted, Blackburnian, yellow-rumped, Nashville, black-throated blue, black-throated green, chestnut-sided, and northern perula. Over the years, I've spent many hours watching warblers move through forests high up in the canopy, so to have some just landing all around me at ground level honestly felt like Christmas. Hopefully this is a good sign of things to come for the rest of migration. So far, I've mostly been exploring the forest pond and you may be wondering what's living in the one at the front of the property. Well, both ponds share a lot of the same wildlife, overwintered tadpoles, fresh frog spawn, and many of the same insects. But the big question mark is whether there's still brook trout in here or not. If something like an American mink found this pond in the winter, it could wipe out the fish in just a few days. We haven't seen any swimming around yet and it's interesting that there's tadpoles and frog spawn since frogs prefer to breed in fish-free waters. All of this led me to believe that there wasn't any fish in here, but I wanted to find out for myself. I was going to start by fishing, but I figured it would make more sense to actually see a trout first, just so I'm not trying to catch something that isn't there. So I found a container of fish food that the previous owners left and tried bringing the trout to the surface. Alright, fish or no fish, let's see. I'm going to guess no fish, just because- oh my god, there's, <laughs> there's like five fish that just popped up. Okay, well, consider me wrong. After fishing for a while, it looks like there's around 15 to 20 trout in here. Knowing what's in these ponds gives us a better idea of what we can do with them. For now, I think keeping the forest pond as a large amphibian breeding site would be best. And at the front, maybe we can stock it with smaller fish and add some fallen logs and perches to potentially attract fish-eating birds or mammals. But let me know if you have any ideas. I decided I want to spend as much of this first year at this new property exploring and observing all the nature and wildlife before starting any big projects. The next thing I'll be focusing on is peak bird migration and I can't wait to see which species pass through this beautiful forest. Mm -hmm. 